Okay, thank you everybody for coming. You know, hopefully we'll see if we get some more stragglers in here after the uh, lunch hour, but um, you know, I'm happy that you're able to, to make it here on such a boring, uneventful day in the markets, right? <laughs> Only got volatility up 33% the last time I checked, so uh, I, I think that qualifies as probably a high anxiety market, uh, at least in my book. So in any event, thank you again. If you're not familiar with who I am, my name's Mike Larson. I work for Weiss Ratings. Uh, we're an in independent research and publishing firm in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. We've been at this since the mid-1970s, and you know, I've had the pleasure of coming to various money shows since 2005. Always nice to meet with investors and, and talk shop, so I hope you get a lot out of this presentation. I want to start with looking at the big picture, and I think when you do, I'd say we've obviously had an extremely favorable and to some degree arguably artificial market environment that uh, began in March 2009 and lasted, by my reckoning, through about January of this year. Um, but what started happening in many markets in January, I think, has turned this into a different kind of backdrop. And there's a number of different reasons for that. Um, we have monetary and fiscal policy that's diverging between here and overseas. We obviously, especially with the action that we've seen just this week, uh, energy prices and interest rates are marching higher. And in fact, this week have, have certainly jumped higher. Um, by my reckoning, we have the, the five-year Treasury at its highest level since 2008. The 10-year Treasury at its highest level since 2011, and the 30-year bond yield at its highest level since 2014. And as that's happening, you're starting to see cracks in the market facade begin to appear. Um, mix that in with what I consider to be a lot of herd-like investor behavior, record high levels of risk-taking by many measures, and extreme overvaluation in multiple asset classes. I think it all kind of suggests that 2018 is one of those years where we're at an important inflection or turning point. And, and really my best advice to start off is that if you're following that pre-2018 playbook, you're kind of like this guy and doing things wrong. So uh, you, you don't want to be him, let's put it that way. <laughs> so in any event, if we talk about what got us here, right? What got us here first? I mean, most of us know the background, so we'll, we'll be pr pretty brief here. But uh, major central banks had embarked on an unprecedented quantitative easing worldwide. You've seen it here in the US, Europe, Japan, the UK, and on and on. And the collective action of that was to swell central bank balance sheets to more than $20 trillion, which was essentially four times the pre-crisis levels that we had. And in conjunction with and along with that, we had central banks worldwide that cut interest rates for a total of about 667 times in the post-crisis period. If you look at you know, not just, again, the major central banks, but also many of the smaller central banks around the world. Um, in all of history, I mean, the Fed never even came close to printing the amount of money that they did. And it's funny because when you look at like the, some of the smaller blips before the great financial crisis, you have what back then would have been considered a mountain. That little spike there at the end of 99 was what they did when we thought all the banks were going to you know, not work on January 1st, 2000 after the Y2K situation. Um, but that was considered a huge amount. And obviously what's happened since then dwarfed that considerably. And in all of history, we never had the Fed keep interest rates both so low and so long. That's, you know, it's that double whammy of ultra low rates for an ultra long period of time. And this just shows you every Fed cycle going back to the 1970s. And you can see that that stretch recently was the longest we've ever seen. If you want to visualize what happened to central bank balance sheets, this here shows you all the majors, everything from the Swiss National Bank to the People's Bank of China, as well as the Fed, ECB, and so on. Your left scale is in dollar value the size of their balance sheets. And the right scale is as a percentage of GDP. So you can see basically both as an ultimate number as well as as a percentage of world GDP, we've never seen anything like this. And certainly what also is interesting is after the Fed kind of leveled off in 2014, 2015, many of the other world central banks shifted into overdrive. So what was the, the collective uh, consequence of all of this happening? I think on some level we've destroyed that rational, traditional way of valuing assets. And in many markets, I'd argue, we've seen pretty much a speculative orgy, one of the biggest the world's ever seen. And what's noteworthy about this cycle is that it's not like the late 1990s when that bubble was sort of largely confined to tech stocks. And it's not even like the early 2000s or mid 2000s when it was largely concentrated in housing and mortgages. Um, I'm actually about 200 some odd pages into a book on this. And I think I've been able to find example after example of how this has infiltrated asset markets of all kinds. I mean, stocks of all types bonds of all types, but it's commercial real estate, 
it's housing, it's modern and classic artwork, it's baseball cards, NFL teams. There was actually just a story today or yesterday out of Japan where they sold the most expensive bottle of whiskey in world history. Um, assets of all kinds have been inflated to unbelievable levels. And you see it, again, billionaires row penthouses in New York City, things I'll call garbage IPOs, which I get to. It really shows that the easy money policies that we had this time have created what I've decided to call the Uber bubble, the, the ultimate example of a bubble, because it's so comprehensive, it impacts so many different assets, and that's what necessarily makes it more concerning than what we've had in the last two cycles. We'll start off, of course, with stocks, because that's what most people here are interested in. And this chart just shows the CAPE ratio, the cyclically adjusted PE ratio, going all the way back to the late 1800s. If you've ever seen the work of Robert Schiller, he's the guy behind this. And the idea is to smooth out the earnings cycle, look at how the value of stocks relative to a smoothed earnings cycle is. And, and the most recent number is right around 33 and change, which is essentially double the long-term average. We did get higher at one point in history. It wasn't really the best time to invest in stocks. That was the dot-com peak. Uh, and we're even higher than we were heading into the, the stock market crash in 1929. Now, what's interesting, though, when you listen to CNBC, you hear a lot of talk about how earnings have gone up, so the price-to-earnings ratio, and it's not all that bad. Uh, what they don't tell you about, uh, again, is when you adjust for over the cycle, it is. And when you look at other things like price to book and price to revenue. Uh, this chart here shows the S&P 500 market cap as a ratio to revenues. And you'll see at just over 2.1 times, we've never been more overvalued on a price to sales basis in the history of the U.S. market. Nor if you strip out foreign uh, issues that trade here and then compare that to U.S. gross national product just to sort of get what's going on domestically. Uh, we're essentially tied for what happened at the dot-com peak in terms of price to sale, so worth noting. And as I mentioned, it's certainly not just the equity market where you're seeing these valuation issues. It's also house prices. This chart here shows you the S&P Case-Shiller National Home Price Index. Um, obviously, the big run-up we all know about in the early 2000s as a result of all the stupid mortgage lending going on and speculation, the big declines we had as a result of that bust, and now we're you know some odd 15 20% above on a nationwide basis the house price peak we had at the top of the last real estate bubble. This is a, you know, it's great to talk about numbers, but it's also good to drill down into specific examples. So this I'd like to show you here is 1375 Bird Avenue in beautiful San Jose, California. Um, as you can see, it's not exactly the kind of thing they show on HGTV. It is a 42-year-old, 1,066 square foot house, um, burn, mostly burned out. You can see, you know, plywood over the windows, beautiful place, weeds overgrowing it, and so on. This property hit the market in April 2018 for $799,000. It sold for $938,000, or about 17% over asking, and that transaction took place in 25 days, which gives you a price of $880 per square foot. As a matter of fact, in San Francisco area, being one of the most overheated markets in the U.S., house prices were recently rising by more than $561 per day, or about $23.40 per hour. So you could pretty much sit in your living room playing Xbox, and you'd make more money than you would by having a job. So again, that's an extreme example, but you get the idea. Uh, and, what, and again, what's interesting is the all-encompassing nature. This here shows you what's happened to commercial real estate property. Uh, it's a company called Green Street that tracks valuations in CRE. You can see in what was considered to be the largest real estate bubble this country ever saw, um, that's sort of where it's indexed to 100 there, and then the declines to an index value of 62.7. And now we're up around 130, which means we're essentially 30% above the valuations we had at the peak of what is largely acknowledged as the biggest real estate bubble this country has ever seen. So again, commercial real estate. Now, the reason I showed that house example and why I want to touch on some other things is I don't just like to look at quantitative things. I also look at qualitative. What's going on? You know, what can you see with your own two eyes that either confirm or deny what your sort of you know, numbers-based analysis tells you? Well, if you look at what's going on in, in sort of investment bankers and corporations and how they're behaving, it's sort of like that tacky Girls Gone Wild video they had, the guy got arrested for or whatever. I mean, except it's investment bankers and corporations that have gone wild. Total corporate debt, $6.1 trillion at the end of 2017, which is up 84% in a decade. And it's not just the volume of corporate debt, it's the quality of it. Higher risk leverage loan borrowing, for example, very sort of extreme on the risk scale, is at all-time records. A lot of that money being raised is to fuel what is essentially an M&A mania. And it's interesting, a lot of people look at, at transactions and buyouts as being a bullish factor for the stock market, and it is to a point. 
what you see at the top of every cycle is big mega deals that end up blowing up. I mean, if anybody goes back to 2000, it was the old AOL Time Warner deal, $160 million or, or billion dollars, whatever it was. And obviously that was right around the peak of that market cycle. Uh, we have deal pace at a record. We have deal funding up 23% to a record $250 billion. As a matter of fact, we've actually seen a resurgence and an explosion in things called SPACs, special purpose acquisition companies, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but these, thing, these uh, entities are raising record dollar amounts. The only other time we came close was at the peak of the 06, 07 credit bubble. And when it comes to leverage buyouts, private equity firms and what they're paying in terms of prices, all-time record multiples to EBITDA, or core earnings generation, cash generation, uh, multiple about 11.2 on average transaction in late 17. When it compares to, you know, when you actually did have values out there as a buyout company in 2009 when the markets were at a low point in the cycle, Ratios were about 7.7, so. Visuals are great. This is a chart showing corporate debt outstanding going all the way back to the turn of the century. What's interesting is that even though we had an economic boom in the early to mid 2000s, kind of tied into what was going on in housing, uh, corporate debt didn't do much. It was up, but just, you know, kind of kind of crawling higher because that was all about mortgages, home mortgages and consumer side of the, of the uh, economy. But you can see we've essentially taken off and almost doubled the level of debt we have outstanding on the corporate side this time. So that's where the focus really is. This chart uh, from a company called DealLogic that tracks M&A and so on is really instructive. This shows through the end of the first quarter of this year, the average in their database going back to the mid-1990s, the average volume of deals basically was around $624 billion through the first quarter of each year. Um, you can see in the light blue, I highlighted what the uh, peak was in the March 2000 year, when obviously we're at the top of the dot-com bubble. That was about $1.06 uh, trillion of deal making. The peak at the 2007 credit bubble was about $1.04 trillion. And in this, whatever you want to call it, environment, Uber bubble, we've surpassed both the dot-com peak, the credit bubble peak, and we've essentially doubled, almost doubled the volume we've had throughout all of history, uh, going back to 95, with about $1.12 trillion of deals through March. So again, unprecedented volume in terms of dollar size of deals. I mentioned earlier the issue of leverage lending, leverage corporate lending. This chart uh, from the Wall Street Journal goes back and shows the volume of this stuff that's outstanding in the U.S. and Europe, U.S. and green and Europe and yellow. Uh, you can see um, all-time record last year, uh, excuse me, annual issuance, not vol volume outstanding. Uh, all-time record last year, and this only goes through July, so that's why the 18 bar is as low as it is. But if it, you essentially carry it forward through the year end, and if nothing changes, we'll have set another all-time record for the issuance of this higher risk, uh, junkier debt um, in 2018. Now, SPACs, if you're not familiar with the term, essentially you go out and raise money on your reputation. You have, you have no plan, you have no financials because you're a brand new issuance, you have no history, but in this market, a problem. You say, give me a couple billion dollars, I'm going to go out and buy stuff. That, that is essentially what they do. And the issue, you know, again, there's always some of these entities out there, but what's noteworthy is that we had a record issuance uh, in 06 and 07, right before the credit market collapsed. And lo and behold, in 16 and 17, we have even higher records issuance of this stuff in 2016 and 2017. So again, kind of an interesting, uh, you know, far out on the risk curve type thing. And this chart just shows you those LBO purchase price multiples I mentioned. Um, again, late 2017 going for about 11.2 times EBITDA. Um, again, over the peaks that we had in 2006, 2007, and certainly the highest yet in this cycle. So uh, people are reaching in the private markets, in the go private markets, and in the public markets. And what's funny is, you know, when you're trying to justify or, or explain why you're making this deal at these absurd valuations and so on, one of the great things you can do is kind of adjust to the numbers. You can take, all right, EBITDA, well, we're going to sell this division, or, you know, this is a bad year because of X, Y, and Z. And on a smooth, forward basis, things are going to be great. So it's not really that bad. So what's interesting is that in the percentage of deals in the first quarter of 2018, we had more than 26% of these transactions that had EBITDA adjustments. You know, you can call it fudging numbers, whatever you want to, which is an all-time record. It's higher than the 14-some-odd percent we saw at the peak of the 2000 cycle, higher than the 15-some-odd percent peak we saw at 2006. So essentially, companies, LBOs, private equity are, you know, depending what, if you want to use a charitable term or you want to say lying, are you know, fudging the numbers in an increasingly aggressive fashion to a degree we've never before seen in this country. And 
if you're familiar with how some of these loans work, uh, typically there's covenants involved, restrictions on what the, the company borrowing the money can do. You know, they have to maintain certain ratios of earnings. They have to, you know, they can't pay their, their buyout companies dividends to a certain level. There's, again, these are called covenants. They're restrictions. What happens is as the lending money or lending market gets easier and easier, uh, the lender or the investors in this paper say, you know, the lenders in this paper say, you know what, I don't want to, I'll give you, I'll let you off the hook. You don't have to do any of that stuff. So we have the highest share ever of covenant light, meaning loans without those restrictions, around 75%, the highest share this country has ever seen. Uh, so again, you know, bar companies that are borrowing money are borrowing record amounts of it. They're borrowing it in the highest risk markets, and they're not having any restrictions put on them. So they're going out and doing whatever the heck they want, which is pretty unique. What else is noteworthy is that it's not just junk companies or high yield companies that are doing this, uh, it's junk countries. This is a chart showing sovereign bond issuance, so government bond issuance by junk rate, the, the furthest sort of you know, frontier emerging market type nations. They were borrowing to the tune of about $70 billion as of late 2017, uh, which essentially, again, compared to what you saw at the peak of 06, 07, down around $30 billion, you know, double that amount plus some, uh, higher than we saw at the peak of the 99 cycle and way higher than we saw in 97, 98, uh, right before we had the whole long-term capital management crisis and all the stuff that happened back then. Uh, that's countries, emerging market companies as well have really been feeding at this trough. Um, total debt outstanding of emerging market companies, closing, and this is dollar denominated debt, um, closing in at almost $3 trillion. Uh, so again, a, a huge run up both in terms of government debt uh, corporate debt here in the U.S. and foreign debt. Uh, and it's really not a geographic issue, right? This is a chart um, that essentially shows a wide variety of countries, Argentina, Chile, Malaysia, India, Russia, and on and on. Um, you know, whether you're talking about South America, I know it's kind of hard to read, but just, you know, the bottom line is that when you're talking about South America, Asia, Europe, Middle East, Africa, that's what that whole EMEA acronym means. The story's the same. It's debt, debt, and more debt. I mentioned earlier the principle of garbage IPOs, right? Um, I would argue that Wall Street is definitely at this stage dumping trash on your doorstep, and, and I'll explain why. Um, we've had an IPO fever, a little bit of an IPO fever the last year or so. Through the first nine months of 2018, we've had 100 and com 180 companies come public, and in doing so, raising about $50 billion, which puts this year on track to be the second busiest for IPOs, with the exception of 14, since you guessed at the 2000.com bubble peak. So what kind of companies are raising money? Well, I had a little fun going through the numbers uh, in June. I don't know if you call it fun, but whatever. Um, there were 37 IPOs that priced in the month of June, which was an extremely busy month. Now, of those 37, only 26 were traditional companies. There were a couple of those SPACs mixed in. There were some other you know, unique cases. But basically, 26 out of the 37 of those were your traditional companies raising money. It's, I kind of gave it away here, but I, I, would, I should have asked, you know, how, if you guessed how many of those 26 companies were actually, you know, surprise, surprise, making money, the number is four, which meant 85% of the companies that came public lost money in all of 2017. You could say, was that a one-off situation? Well, no, every single one of the companies that lost money last year also lost money in 2016. And if you net the losses from the money losers against the handful of companies that were making money, you get a net negative number of $754 million. So uh, that's just June, by the way. But it really does speak to this wonderful slide, which I thank the Wall Street Journal for publishing the other day. I had an earlier version of it. Um, this shows you the percentage of companies. And again, percentage of companies is an important point. We have fewer companies going public. But we're talking about a percentage, so it's not the dollar volume or number of companies, which is down from what we had at the mania peak in 1999-2000. This shows you the percentage of the companies that did go public, how many of them lost money in the 12 months prior to their IPO. What do you see? Well, 83% over the first nine months of this year of companies were losing money, which has now, ding, ding, hit a new record, topping the 81% peak. The only time we ever saw it was when companies like Pets.com there were going public in 99-2000. And what's, what's really amazing to me, um, Uber is just a fun example because you have private market valuations which have gone totally nuts as well. It's not just in public markets. Um, Uber, you know, it's a company that many of us use. I used it to go to dinner last night and so on. Great concept, great company, been around for eight years. Well, should be a great company, except for one minor detail. They have never made one penny of operating profits in more than eight years of operation. Here's your quarterly adjusted EBITDA, so not even bottom line numbers. Minus 597 million, minus 773 million, minus a billion and change, 
minus 775 million. Of course, during that eight plus year track record of burning through several billion dollars, uh, its valuation has gone up 1,333,233%. So if anybody think that makes sense, good luck to you. What I've also noted is really the, the dogpiling or herding investor behavior that we've had into the same kinds of stocks. So it's not just valuations, it's not just some of these ex extreme examples like Uber. This chart simply compares the performance of the Russell 1000 Growth Index, which as the name suggests has a lot of technology and other high growth companies, versus the Russell 1000 Value Index, which is made up of the you know, sort of steady eddy type names, utilities and what have you. And it compares the ratio. So you can see this chart goes all the way back to the late 1970s. There is one huge green spike, or two huge green spikes that you can see. One is right around 99, 2000, and one is now. What it essentially shows is that the ratio has never been this skewed in favor of growth versus value, uh, except for one time in modern market history, and when was that? The dot-com bubble peak. Another slide that kind of shows the same thing, it just compares the ratio on an inverse scale of the utility average, XLU, to XLK, which is the technology ETF. Both of those ETFs rolled out in the late 1990s, and you can see utilities, being a value representative, have never underperformed technology to this degree, except for one other time in history, which was the dot-com bubble peak. One other thing that kind of should be self-evident, but I think we need to talk about it, is that equity should have some tie to the underlying economy, a real GDP, right? The value of assets is, is somewhat tied to what the economy can produce, what earnings and sales and so, so on and so forth are doing. Um, but what's noteworthy is because of this bubble environment, we have never had household net wealth, meaning the value of your assets, your homes, your, your stocks, and so on, has never been more inflated relative to the underlying value of GDP in all of human history. Um, we're trading it right now at about 5.24 times in terms of wealth to GDP. At the peak of the last bubble, that was 4.85. And at the peak in 2000, it was 4.45. So um, yeah, it's pretty remarkable. It, it's, it, it's a different way of looking at valuation, but I think it is pretty extraordinary to see what's happening with assets versus what's happening with the underlying economy. So what's changed? Why, what are some of the forces that are making the market environment look a little different now than it was throughout this you know, period that started in 2009? I think one major difference is to, after 10 years of cheap money and radical policy experimentation, rates are in fact finally going up. Um, you know, whether it's Kuroda in Japan or Draghi in Europe or, you know, former Yellen and, uh, and Bernanke and now Powell, um, we are seeing a change in the, changing of the guard in terms of what's happening with rates. Um, this gives you an idea of the, the global interest rate cycle a little bit, going back to the, you know, the mid-2000s. Each color-coded line is giving you a different snapshot, the U.S., the Eurozone, the U.K., and so on. Um, far right, you can see the blue line representing the U.S., and, and actually this chart isn't updated for what just happened uh, at the September meeting, so that's actually even higher, around 2 to 2.25%. Two um, Canada has already started increasing rates. The U.K. is falling behind. Euro area and Japan have not, but they are talking out and actually dialing down some of the QE that's been happening, so in their own fashion, they are tightening. Um, what, what's really notable about this interest rate cycle, though, is to compare it to what's happened in the last five major interest rate cycles since the 70s. Uh, you all probably remember that the, the 70s cycle was a whopper. I mean, you know what happened back then, 18% interest rates and all that kind of, kind of stuff that was going on. Uh, so that is the standout one to the upside. But on average, it, you know, each, before each cycle started, each raising cycle started, rates remained at a low for just over 11 months versus 84 months in this period. Um, the average cycle maxed out at about 22 months, whereas we're 33 months and counting into this one. Um, but in terms of all that time we've taken, we've also had a much smaller magnitude of hikes. The average is about 563 basis points, or 5.6 percentage points, and we're only at 200 so far. And even if, again, even if you were to say, okay, what happened in the 70s was an outlier, and you knock that big number out, you're still talking somewhere in the 300 range, 300, 350, in terms of what you should expect in an average cycle. So what that all means is that the Fed is not or should not be done raising rates, and that probably won't happen anytime soon, unless something blows up. What does that mean? Well, again, rates are rising fat, fast. This is the uh, two-year Treasury. You can see that about 2.8%, and this was done before the, the big shock to rates we had this week. So this is right before I left. We're at 2.82, um, which puts us back to where we were in 2008. Um, overall, the yield curve has generally been flattening, a little bit of widening out this week, but we've seen the, the spread between two-year and 10-year Treasury note yields um, really collapsing. I mean, we're at 11-year 11, 11 lows. There are two other times when we've had rates fall this much, this consistently, uh, you know, week, month in, month out, and it was, as you see, before the 
2000 bust and before the housing bust in the mid-2000s, though again, as noted, we're not inverted yet on this curve. One thing that's happening also, in addition to the interest rate moves, is that the Fed is in fact shrinking its balance sheet. We maxed out at about $4.48, $4.49 trillion in terms of U.S. Fed balance sheet size. As of uh, last week, I believe these numbers are updated, we're down to about 4.2. So get closing in on $300 billion of balance sheet, balance sheet shrinkage in the U.S. So uh, that's kind of some of the background fuel coming out of the market. And while up until this week it hadn't had much of an impact on U.S. stocks, you know, what the increase in short-term rates here plus the foot dragging and, and slower pace of hikes overseas has resulted in is a big rally in the U.S. dollar. Uh, you know, we've seen the, the losses versus the USD has been particularly severe when it comes to emerging markets, and it hasn't just been emerging market currencies, it's been their stock markets, their bond markets, and so on. And again, up until this week, the U.S. markets have largely ignored that. You know, we had the S&P flirting with a new high. But frankly, it's exactly what happened in 97, 98. Um, you know, it, it sounds kind of glib and but it won't matter until it does. And when it does, it will really, really matter. We had the Dow plunge about 20% in six weeks in 1998. Um, and this just shows you, you know, index to 100, a change in value of various currencies against the US dollar. Uh, this is a little outdated. Some of them have bounced a little bit since I made this in late August. We are talking about Brazilian real, Turkish lira, Argentinian peso, and so on. All of them have been steadily declining against the, against the US dollar throughout 2018. And what that's done, again, is result in this huge divergence between U.S. markets and foreign markets. Um, this chart here shows you on the lower panel the split between the performance of the U.S. S&P 500 and the, you know, the uh, MSCI Emerging Markets Index. And truly, we're at a 22-year high in terms of divergence, almost an all-time extreme uh, with our market outperforming foreign markets. So pretty unique, pretty extreme. And, you know, when things tend to get stretched, what happens when the rubber band breaks? That's my big concern. One of two things is going to have to happen. U.S. stocks are going to have to catch down to what's going on overseas, or foreign markets are going to have to catch up to what's going on here. And because of many other indicators, I kind of worry that it's going to be the, the negative scenario. Um, another way of looking at this is to look at what's happening in 70 different indexes all, or countries all around the world. Uh, what this red line shows you is the percentage of markets out of those 70 that have experienced a death cross. And if you're familiar with technical analysis at all, that's your 50-day moving average trading down through your 200-day moving average, generally seen as sort of a longer-term trend indicator. We had more than 60% of world markets that experienced this death cross as, as of a couple weeks ago, uh, which is getting up towards those levels that we had at, at big uh, market declines. But what's interesting is you look at the other peaks where we had this, the U.S. market was collapsing as well. So it hasn't happened here yet, which, again, is, is a stretch, a difference from what we've had. Um, one thing to sort of tie it up uh, with the bow here and looking at, at bear market risk. Um, this is a chart that I find pretty interesting from Goldman Sachs. It looks at this bear market risk indicator that they have, which combines a number of different things. Uh, what our ISM index is doing, that's the one that tracks manufacturing, what the slope of the yield curve is, unemployment, valuations. It's kind of all thrown into a pot. And their testing has shown this is pretty effective in telling you what the risk is. It doesn't mean you're going to wake up on Monday morning and the Dow is going to be down 5,000 points. It's not really a timing indicator per se, but it is a sentiment and overall market backdrop thing. And you can see, as of their indicator, it's basically the highest it's been in 50 some odd years. Um, above the peaks we had at the top of the housing bubble, above the peaks we had at the top of the dot-com bubble. So again, a very elevated risk market. Um, one thing that's noteworthy, um, well, two things, I'll start with one that's not shown here, is that the volatility index, the VIX, um, you know, was trading at ridiculously low levels in 2017. We had something like 30 days, I think it was, where the VIX was under 10. That's never happened in, in the history of the VIX index, uh, extreme complacency. What happened is the VIX spiked when we had that, that big mess in January, February, where the markets got hammered, 2,000-point down days in the Dow. Um, and then it started to come in, but it never dropped back into that, that low range that we had in 16 and 17. It basically is in a new higher range. And I, you know, I didn't put the chart up there, probably should have, but it has. So that's a divergence. You have the S&P that's tested a new high, but volatility hasn't dropped back into that zone. And at the same time that volatility hasn't done that, credit spreads have not done that either. Throughout the post, I mean, energy, when the energy market collapsed, it obviously sent credit spreads through the roof. All those energy companies that had borrowed money, when, I mean, a lot of bankruptcies, a lot of defaults, and so on. Ever since that energy chaos had its hit its worst level and steadily improved as oil prices bottomed and so on, um, you've had credit spreads that have been marching lower. And a spread is just the difference in yield for a triple B rated bond and an underlying U.S. Treasury. Uh, that spread, that risk spread, had been narrowing all the way through January along with the rise in the S&P. 
Um, it's no longer doing that. As a matter of fact, it spiked into July, it's pulled back in a little bit, but it's nowhere near those lows. So again, if you're looking for things that are weird, that are different from the environment we've had for the last several years, chalk up credit and volatility both in that, um, that category. And one other thing we're able to do at Weiss Ratings, uh, we've, you know, we've had this, this stock rating model, this model that rates stocks, ETFs, mutual funds. We have more than 40,000 individual securities, including all the classes of mutual funds that you have for each individual underlying fund. Um, and we are able to look at things like buy-sell ratios, which is just like it says. You know, how many stocks are we having in the buy zone versus how many stocks we're having in the sell zone? And it generally tracks a healthy market. I've looked, you know, talked to some of the guys that I work with, and it's generally, you know, a good indicator. What I found noteworthy on the left-hand side when I zeroed into the short term, just since 2016, is that our buy-sell ratio actually peaked last summer, in summer of 17, and made a slightly lower high when the market made a higher high in January, and it's made a much lower high this time around, even with the market rebound. What I think that's telling you, again, is behind the scenes, at least in our coverage universe, which, as I've said, is very comprehensive, Fewer stocks are in that are meriting a buy rating now versus a sell rating, and it hasn't been improving along with the mark the broader averages, which I think again underscores some of the divergence divergences we're seeing. And it's also true on the long term. Um, you can see the big 14-15 collapse in the buy sell was related to all the energy credits getting downgraded and so on. And we rebounded, but we didn't get back up to where we were. So just one of those cautionary symbols. What's that? Yes, we have a very, um, a very a much stricter uh, system in terms of rating than we have. A, few, a lot fewer stocks are going to get buy ratings in our um, coverage scheme or system, whatever you want to call it, uh, than in others. And frankly, that's because it's designed to be more conservative. It's not just a, uh, it's not just a ignoring reward and only, or excuse me, ignoring risk and only look at reward. It's a system that has th things like volatility, dividends, and other sort of uh, risk reduction things built into the model. So it is designed to be more conservative. Now, what this table shows is a lot going on here, so I tried to highlight the important column. This just looks at S&P 500 valuations across a whole spectrum of, of different indicators. Trailing price to earnings, forward price to earnings, the Schiller PE I mentioned earlier, uh, price to free cash flow, enterprise value to sales, a bunch of different indicators to look at the valuation of the market. But what's important is you know, your positives versus your negative numbers, or what's boxed, basically show a boxed thing shows that it's higher than average, and unboxed shows it's lower than average. And you can see by most indicators we're higher, and not by a small amount. You know, 79% overvalue, 28%, 10% over average, and so on. So it's not just some of the things I've been showing. It is pretty comprehensive as, you know, this analysis, which was a great one that I saw. Now, one thing really, really noteworthy, if you're kind of looking for a tripwire type event, what made a big difference, and to me, kind of signified a big turn. It's that I call the Facebook's, you know, $120 billion face plan. I mean, we, you know, in 24 hours in July, you had Facebook, you know, extremely popular stock. Everybody owns it. Uh, I think 52 out of 54 analysts had a buy rating, you know, just like we saw in 99, 2000. And it lost $119 plus billion in market cap in 24 hours. Um, that's worse than we ever saw in any tech stock back in 2000. I mean, Intel, Microsoft, around 91 and $80 billion. It's worse than we ever saw in one day of any stock in the 2008 crisis. Exxon was about 52 and a half, and GE was about 47. Granted, those are, numbers are not adjusted for inflation, but you do get the nominal amounts. I mean, this is something that we've never before seen, even in two collapses, and it happened at a time when the market arguably, you know, was close to its highs, not in the deep distressed periods of 2000 and 2008. To me, we have a lot of overhyped, overowned, overvalued stocks, especially in sectors like technology. I mean, I showed you that, that it's never before seen like this except for one period in history, which was 99, 2000. So I think that speaks to, you know, when you have those kinds of extremes, those kinds of valuations, it's not a timing tool, but it does tell you if somebody screws up, you are going to get screwed as an investor with a major, major loss, which is what ha clearly happened to Facebook. Bottom line. What I've done personally and what I've been recommending, I was very bullish on the markets and safe money report and some of the other things, the communications I put out uh, after the Trump election. It doesn't have anything to do with it, whether I like him or not as a person. It has to do with the policies. Um, you know, his policies were bullish for the markets. Uh, we were earlier in the economic and market cycle. So essentially, we're 100% invested. And in, in, in a lot of sectors like financials, technology, things that were, you know, growthier sectors. But I really started flipping things around in January, February, because all those lingering long-term concerns I ha had the market started to care. We started to see volatility move up. We started to see credit spreads widen. We started to see divergences. So that was sort of the technical and timing um, 
elements that told me all these sort of background concerns you're having are really starting to become an issue. So essentially, I started telling people, cut your exposure in stocks. I mean, me personally, I lowered my 401k exposure to the lowest it's been in many, many years. And you know, I'm, I'm a 42-year-old guy. I don't mind saying uh, you've got a lot of years to retirement, hopefully. And you know, still, I think that a defensive posture for me, as well as for our clients and subscribers, was, uh, was fully justified. Um, been rotating, you know, I think that it makes sense to be rotating into some safer, higher rated, um, less volatile sectors, utilities, REITs, and staples. They're actually getting hit because interest rates are going up today. But what's noteworthy is all the way through February, March, till about you know, a month ago, these sectors were actually starting to outperform technology. Uh, it seems crazy, but one, three, and six month returns were better on a few of these sectors um, than you had in tech that everybody talks about on CNBC 500 times a day. So you're starting to see conservatism uh, be reflected in what people are owning. And I think that after this correction, I think you know, you're going to see the leadership resume in, in safer haven type investments. And the last thing, if it's something you're comfortable with, things like ETFs, inverse ETFs, put options, hedges uh, that make money when stocks go down, I think you know, that kind of tool, I certainly haven't been recommending or, or using for a long time, but I am beginning to tiptoe into that stuff again. And I think some of these growthier sectors, financials, especially tech and so on, um, are looking vulnerable. So that's, uh, those are kind of the prescriptions for what I'd say to do. And when it comes to drilling down to a few of the names that are in the safe money report that, you know, again, they're going to correct here with interest rates going up, but I think ultimately they're going to retain their value and they're going to be the kind of companies that, uh, that people really start turning to. One Gas is one of them, uh, OGS. It's rated B by our Weiss rating system. And just like you'd expect, A and B stocks are considered buys, C's are holds, and D's and E's are sells. Uh, each stock gets a plus or minus rating if it merits that as well. Uh, it's based in Tulsa, natural gas utility, nothing too exciting have about 2.2 million customers and a dividend yield recently of 2.2%. They're planning on raising that about 7 to 9% per year through 2022. So again, safer, more boring, but ultimately I think a better stock for this part in the cycle and uh, you know this, this market environment. Getty Realty is another one I like, GTY, also rated B. Uh, it's a REIT, but it's one that owns and leases gas stations, convenience stores, things like that. So they're not in more economically sensitive office property or retail with all the Amazoning of the world going on. They're not really exposed to that. Uh, you know, you're still going to fill up your tank and so on, even in a lousy uh, market if we ha or economy if that happens. Plus, you got a nice yield of 4.6% indicated recently. Their payout's been going up more than 15% a year for the last half decade. And they are growing by M&A, but they're doing it in a conservative fashion. So that's kind of a more defensive REIT that I still am okay with. Uh, Old Republic, ORI, rated A-. minus. That would kind of be the third name I'd recommend taking a look at. They're a specialty insurer. They've got 27 subsidiaries. They're active in all U.S. states and a handful of Canadian provinces. Um, what's interesting is they used to be in the mortgage insurance business. They got out of all that, or they're, they're running that portfolio off, so they don't have that exposure, and they've been getting out of that for years. Um, operating income was up more than 20% in the second quarter. Nice 3.5% yield. And, and, and these guys, have, you know, they've been around for a long, long time. They've raised their dividend every year since 1981, so obviously we've been through a lot of good and bad cycles during that period. But that's the kind of thing that I'm looking at that I still am comfortable recommending as long as you have higher cash levels and as long as you're you know, looking at some hedges as well. Um, I think what, how I'd wrap it up and, and say I've been to a lot of these shows. I, I started coming to the Money Show in Orlando back in 2005. Uh, yeah, and I was only on stage. We actually had a subscriber event. We had like 500 people at this breakfast there. And uh, I was one of three other analysts plus Martin Weiss, the founder of our firm. And, um, that was obviously in South Florida, you know, what was happening in real estate at that point. And I got, I used my five minutes of, of stage time to, to, you know, rain down you know, fire and brimstone about how you had to pretty much sell every real estate investment property you own, uh, mortgage stocks, housing stocks, anything with a tangential tie to what was gone to housing, get the heck out of it. And, you know, they tended to go up for a little bit further, but that was February 2005 by, uh, by my memory. And, you know, a year or two later, we know what happened. So I'm not at that stage yet. As you can see, there's still things I'm recommending, but if that was sort of a 10 on the, uh, the fire and brimstone scale, I might be around an 8, just to give you an idea. Um, so in any event, you know, these events are always one point in time. If you're you know, looking for ongoing guidance, the Safe Money Reports, the core product I'm involved with, as the name suggests, we're not trying to shoot the lights out. It is designed for your kind of core, more conservative money. Um, those names that I gave earlier are all in the portfo model portfolio. Monthly basis, and it is being offered at a Money Show Dallas discount of $78 a year. My colleague, Sean Broderick, he's a riskier guy. He likes to take appropriate risks in certain stocks. He, he actually is in charge of the super cycle investor. Um, more frequent, more risky. It, it invests in things like junior miners, cannabis companies. For example, he's very bullish on that sector. He knows that a heck of a lot better than I am, and I'm not ashamed to admit it. Um, anyways, that service is, is more expensive, but that is a discount from the face value there as well. 
if that's you know something you're interested in doing. And if you're not, I don't know if you all are subscribers already. If you're not, you don't know Weiss ratings, you don't know who I am. Thanks for coming if you, that's the case. But you can get an idea for what we do just by signing, going up to our website www.weissratings.com, and you can sign up to receive our free uh, three times a week, and sometimes with special updates in the afternoons depending on what's going on in the markets. Just you know, has some updates on what's going on. I talk about the same kinds of topics here. Uh, a few of the other analysts talk about others. But it's a great way to get introduced to what the company does. So um, with that, I guess we have a little bit of time for Q&A. So I will uh, shut up and let you guys ask questions. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, the, like the names I have in the portfolio, I. Depending on the stock, depending on the volume, I will sometimes use stops. It's not a hard and fast rule that I say if stock X loses 10% in X months, sell it. It's, you know, it's more discretionary. Uh, I do use technical levels and so on for determining that. As a matter of fact, I put out a flash alert about two weeks ago um, because of some of the, the stuff I saw going on where I took profits on a utility that we own, 9.5% in several months, um, and I put a stop under uh, a storage REIT that we owned, and that got, that got triggered when we had what happened here at about break even. So um, you know, it moved up, so I moved the stop up along with it. The short answer, though, again, is I'm not using a, a particular price or percentage pullback. Uh, it's discretionary in what I see going on in technicals. Yes? Oh, sure, yeah. No, I'll, you know, I'll say buy stock XYZ at you know, $56. And then if I put a stop in, I'll give a price level and everything. And, and again, it is a monthly service, but <laughs> this year I've put out probably five uh, flash alerts after doing one last year, just because, thing, especially after the January, February turbulence. So it will get active if I feel the need to get defensive or, or, or do something given what's happening in the market. Yes, sir? You know, I always, I've been asked at various times at these events about things like Bitcoin, things like cannabis, and I am not going to be one of those people who tells you uh, about or pretend to know what they don't know about. And I'm frankly not an expert in that sector. That's Sean's bailiwick. He's not at the show, unfortunately, um, but, you know, in his service, and, and he, he does write. Um, he, he's in the rotation sometimes, so he will talk about ideas and what he sees happening in that market. But I don't have a name for you, unfortunately, for today. Yes, ma'am. Well, we've had eight to date, right? I mean, we started at zero. We're at two percentage points now. Um, you know, it's all but locked in, barring us waking up on Monday morning and the Dow's down 5,000 points, like I said. I think the Fed's clearly a go in December. Um, you know, what's interesting is next year, there is going to be a press, really, or a press conference after every meeting. So as opposed to what we had before, uh, every meeting should pretty much be considered live. Now, I don't think the Fed's going to get out there and like a machine gun, you know, every single meeting, bam, 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 hike. They'll probably mix in some steps in between. But, uh, you know, I, the Fed themselves, they're looking for three, three and a half percent on sort of their longer term projections, which is obviously anywhere from four to six more hikes. Um, I would say that, it, you know, in, when you look at the past cycles, there used to be sort of like that last uh, boom situation where you had the Fed really get aggressive. In May 2000, you probably remember Greenspan hiked 50 basis points, and that was it. Uh, I think if this Fed had never gone through the great financial crisis, they probably would have hiked 50 last month. I think that the data, the inflation stuff they're looking at, you listen to the comments they're making, all these, these former hawk, or excuse me, former doves have really gone, you know, uh, full hawk now. So, I, and Powell, I think, is a different uh, Fed chairman, obviously, than Yellen or Bernanke or even Greenspan. I mean, I think he really, they'll, they won't admit it, but he ha in their language, they've talked more about asset, uh, you know, valuations, financial stability risk is sort of their, their jargon for it. But I think they're concerned about some of the same stuff I am, even though they won't, you know, come out and say it. Uh, <laughs> One last thing I know, I'm telling you more than you probably want to know, but Powell did an interview earlier, uh, early, earlier this week, I think it was, uh, on TV, and he, he kind of slipped up. He said something like, this is the top of the cycle, and then he corrected himself quickly. He's like, I mean, this is, you know, far into this, I forget how, but he, he actually did let it slip in a Q&A. He said, this is the top of the cycle, and I laughed when I saw it. I actually put it on my Twitter, which is real Mike, at real Mike, Mike Larson, if you want to see it, um, and I said, you know, I don't think he meant to say that, but that tells you a little bit what's going on up here, so uh, kind of interesting. Yes, ma'am. You know, I'm not a political guy by nature. I don't mind saying I'm a registered independent. So, you know, I, I, I look at what's been going on and where we are in, in sort of this cycle and what's driving it. 
I really think that politics grabs a lot more, from a purely economic standpoint. Forget everything else, and obviously it's hard to do in real life, but from, as an investor, if you look at just a pure economic standpoint. I think that politics and the actions uh, that um, you know, are happening in the political arena get a lot more credit for impacting markets than they really are. I think this monetary stuff that's going on, and to some degree fiscal policy kind of turbocharging things in the last year, I don't think it really matters. I think that the economic and interest rate cycle is taking over, uh, and when you start to see some of these asset markets begin to pop, you're already seeing it in a few housing markets where you're seeing you know, things kind of roll over. That's going to be the driver of the, the stock market averages. I don't care what you know, Trump tweets or what, uh, you know, whether the Democrats get the House or whatever. I think that it's going to be really driven by this stuff. So, um, you know, it, it, certainly in one, two days, maybe a week or two, it could impact things bullishly or bearishly, but I think these are the factors that are really driving the markets. Yes, sir. I think we got one last question. Yep. Mm hmm. You know, it's, it's really funny about Jobs Fridays. I, I, in all the years I've been doing this, whether you're talking impact on bonds or stocks, it, it's not just that it's hard to determine whether good news is good news or good news is bad news. It's also good news is sometimes good news for an hour, and then it's bad news by the end of the day. I mean, I've seen really strong job reports where the bond market gets crushed, and by the end of the day, it's up. I've seen days where it's a lousy number, you know, and, and it comes out, and then the bond market goes from being way up to down. My personal sense is you learned a lot by what happened after the ADP number came out and what happened this week. Rates, got, I mean, I have, a, I have what I call a 3F rule when it comes to interest rates in the, mar in the stock market. The stock market doesn't care until 3Fs have been triggered. Rates rise far enough, fast enough, and for long enough. And it's clear evidence from what happened this week that we've kind of flipped the switch from rates are bullish, rates are great, it shows that the economy is doing well, to, oh, geez, rates are going up. How are all these companies going to fund their buybacks? How are, you know, what's going to happen to these interest-sensitive sectors and so on? So if you, if you force me to make a prediction, I think we could get a great number, and I think the stock market could tank. I mean, that's, you know, what, what's driving the market now? I think we flipped that switch from good news is quote-unquote good news to good news is actually bad news. But... You know, just my sense. I mean, I think that overall, though, what's happened since the S&P at the highs is we had these divergences. Uh, you know, I'm not going crazy in there and selling everything and, and buying all 100% inverse ETFs, but I think it confirms a lot of the other stuff I've seen that suggests this market's weaker than behind the scene than you're hearing about at this point. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. I do have one more presentation in the bullpen tomorrow. I believe it's uh, 11:30. So, love to see you there.